We're surrounded by data. This gives us the impression that we know about the world more than we ever did before, and that everything we have data for is more certain, more tangible. But once we have data, we rarely question what it makes it, what, what it makes invisible while making other things visible. I'm a sociologist, and I'm interested in studying people who go missing in data. I do not mean missing in the sense that they don't get counted, though sometimes this is the case, um, but missing in categories, missing in representation. I'm interested in studying this both from the point of the people who think their voices do not get heard or they do not fit into the tiny categories in the survey forms. But I'm also interested in studying this from the point of the data producers who talk about groups um, that are difficult to count and characteristics that are difficult to account for. But sometimes even the most trivial and the most mundane may be uncertain in data. In many ways, my own personal story um, has been learning about the uncertainties in what seem like certainties. Um, I come from Turkey, and although we do have a registration system, uh, in our family there are three people whose birth dates we're not so sure about. And this is my grandmother, my father, and my aunt. Um, they were all registered at a point when they needed to. My grandmother was registered before she got married, and my father was registered before he started school, and my aunt was registered just because my father was being registered. But we don't know about the exact birth date, month, or year. We have an estimate that looks like a certainty in data. I'll come back to this point. Paying attention to uncertainties are important because once social realities are made into data, it becomes difficult to undo their impact and leave the lenses behind, leave the lenses data gives us behind. This might sound like an obvious point to make, but um, we often do not see how the cultural, social, and other political codes enter our data. One important example of this is refugee statistics. Refugee statistics are widely quoted, but notoriously inaccurate. The so-called refugee crisis has been a hot topic for almost five years now. The information we get in popular media about refugees and about migrants is at best puzzling. On the one hand, it's a crisis made by the unmanageability of numbers, but on the other hand, it's a humanitarian crisis made by the same very large numbers. But most often, when you compare numbers across news, um, newspapers, official accounts, numbers rarely match, if at all. It also becomes confusing to trace who cites whose data and based on what definitions and estimations. The question of who's a refugee become opaque in data with value-laden statements about who is deserving and who is not deserving and how we can clinically verify deservingness. When, for instance, we talk about child refugees, the difference between age 18 and age 19 gain profound importance. Calculation mistakes of um, registration personal or unknown or unprovable birth dates then become evidence for undeservingness of the refugee status. Can we ever then talk about accurate refugee statistics? To talk about accuracy of refugee statistics, we need to understand the interests and aims behind collecting them. There are multiple reasons for collecting refugee statistics, the most common being the allocation of resources. In any refugee crisis, knowing or at least estimating the number of people involved is one of the first steps in determining responses to the situation. Neighborhood countries might set up camps, humanitarian agencies might organize emergency aids, and international bodies might evaluate the situation to come up with appropriate responses. And these all require data, they all require numbers. But then once these data are made, they are taken as evidence as for everything. And the allocation of refugees to individual countries, all humanitarian aid, are, are then made from those numbers. 
Although the reasons for collecting refugee statistics might seem straightforward, the actual task of who should be counted as refugee is not very obvious. First, we have the problem of definitions. Who is a refugee? While there are international agreements, most notably the 1951 Geneva Convention, which gets frequently cited, the disagreements in the interpretation, application, and limitations imposed on this conven uh, convention based on, um, by individual countries rarely get discussed. As a result, we deal with multiplicity of categories, multiplicity of definitions. Second, statistics are gathered by technocratic means, and there are usually many bodies involved, which sometimes do not agree on who should be included in the definition. This is why it is possible to hear about three different counts from the same countries, different institutions, as well as three different organizations working within the same country and coming up with different numbers. Refugee statistics are therefore an arena of struggle and reflect the interests of the parties involved. Putting the definitional, definitional issues aside, there are also multiple and sometimes conflict, conflicting interests in including and excluding or in seeking to be included or excluded from refugee statistics. Refugees, for instance, might seek to be counted if being counted involves assistance and security. But by the same logic, they might seek to defer being counted until they reach a destination where they can access security and, uh, and assistance. Convention status, or the refugee status, is a special status within international law and grants important rights and privileges to those who receive it. However, not all asylum applications are successful, and this might be a reason for going missing in data. In other cases, refugees might be exaggerating their household sizes so that they gain as much assistance as possible to help those who they know that they will not be able to get the same assistance. The possibility of doing these is higher in some contexts than others, but the main issue here is that people do shape their existence in data if and whenever they can. Host states might also have their own reasons for counting refugees and their own techniques. The arrival of refugees without any resources and in need of immediate assistance is a big challenge for all countries, especially the poor neighboring countries in conflict zones. Given that whatever assistance these states will be getting will be in direct proportion to the refugees they're hosting, they might be inflating their numbers. But the same countries might also be reducing the numbers they report if they, want, if they would like to give the impression that displaced people, um, that the situation is not long term and the displacement will not be for a long time. And the people are expected to go back to their countries. And international and, interna uh, and national humanitarian agencies might have their own reasons with refugee statistics, especially if they're funded by donations and do not have stable sources of income. Given that their success rates are based on how they manage um, the numbers, they might increase or reduce their numbers to prove whether they, their funding has been successful or not um, has been successful. And last but not least, um, one thing we don't, we don't really hear about when we discuss refugee statistics is the ethics of data collection. When we talk about official statistics, we expect that people's data are protected and they are treated fairly and ethically throughout the data collection. We also expect that enumerators and interviewers are safe and they do not experience any harm. However, in the context of refugees, security concerns are a really important um, important. So does the countries um, allowing independent enumerators to come in and observe and count and make their estimates? It is not impossible to imagine that in certain contexts when the conflict is still going and the places are not safe, same persons might be counted double and some people might not be counted at all. And it's also possible to imagine that there might be rough estimates about people's characteristics, such as their age, educational attainment, occupation, or country of origin. Seeing a number is not the same as hearing someone's story. And among all the uncertainties of refugee um, statistics, it is easy to get caught up with making statistics more accurate 
but forgetting the very conditions that make refugee statistics so uncertain. The story of Aylan Kurdi, the boy who washed ashore in Turkey, was a breaking point in that regard. Or the survival story of Doha from a sunk boat which cost lives to 500 people. From mere numbers, refugees became suddenly lives with past and lost possible futures. It is important to pay attention to what we lose when we reduce the stories to numbers. We are all surrounded by data more than ever before, and we have access to information more than we ever before. But we need to start talking about the missing persons and the missing stories in our data. Looking at refugee statistics is just one way of doing that. It's only when our worlds intersect with the stories we do not see and listen on a usual basis, then we can imagine other possible worlds and perhaps much better ones. Thank you.